ladies and gentlemen, Roddy Doyle. And I move over here. Um, I'm going to read an extract from this new book. It's called The Dead Republic. It's the third part of a trilogy narrated by a man called Henry Smart, who was born in 1901. In the first part, A Star Called Henry, he, uh, he describes his rearing, or his lack of rearing, but his growing up and his involvement in the Irish War of Independence. At the end of the book, he has to get out of Ireland. The second book, Oh, Play That Thing, he arrives in America and stays for quite a while. At the very end of that, he, miss, he meets John Ford, the film director. In the third book, The Dead Republic, he comes back to Ireland. And I'm going to read a piece about uh, a third of the way in. He's in Dublin. He's back in Dublin, so to speak. And I think the only thing you know, need to know is that he has a wooden leg. And he's the caretaker of uh, a national school, a primary school, a public, a public elementary school on the north side of Dublin. I declared war, a guerrilla war. I declared, but no one heard me. I always carried my excuse, the mop or a spanner, and I patrolled, lightly, quietly. I went easy on the limp. I roamed the corridors, upstairs and at the ground floor, and the three extra rooms hidden away at the back. I stood among the hanging coats, and I waited. All the training came back. I'd never lost it. Boys and staff went past, but they didn't see or hear me. I could stand still for hours. I could withstand the pain that ate its way through my leg. I could even ignore it. I listened and I heard the slaps. I counted them, four, five, then the sixth. Six was as many as I'd tolerate, six of the famous best. Three whacks on each open hand with the leather strap. The limit, I'd allow no more. But then I heard the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth. I heard the objections killed in the throats of 54 witnesses, the silent outrage and the terror. I was outside. The boys were inside, watching a brute lose control of himself living it and being destroyed by it. The three o'clock bell, go home, go home. I stepped out from the coats as the door opened and the boys came out in a long, slow line, still pale and scared, but ready to laugh and pretend it had been nothing. It was hard to tell which of them had been the victim, but I saw him and I'd remember him. I made my move. I filled, my, I filled the door before the teacher could get out. This was Mr. Mulher. I didn't know his first name. The job was easier without it. He spoke first. I wasn't going to. Henry, he said, I'll leave you to it. He had his bag, the Maula Scullet, under his arm. He tried to walk around me. I didn't move. He was young, still in his twenties. The latch on the window beyond needs looking at, he said. Good man. I still didn't move. Then I stepped straight into him and shut the door with my heel, just rightly weighted, no big bang or ricochet. He stepped back, all nearly fell, to get out from under me. His bag slipped from under the arm. He held it now in both hands. Fuck the latch on the window, I said. He was short and broad. He came from a line of mountain men, but he was scared. He tried to look outraged, but nothing came out of him. If, I said, I stepped on his foot and brought the rest of me forward to meet it. I was a tall man again. If I ever hear, hear you slapping any of the boys again, I said. I stayed still now, hung right over him. I'll kill you, I told him, slowly. Do you hear me, Mr. Mulher? What do you mean? I hit him. I backhanded the cunt, sent the slap bouncing around the walls and maps. You know what I mean, I said. If a boy misbehaves, you can slap him. Clutching the school bag, he hadn't touched his face where I'd, where I'd whacked him. He was turning red and his eyes were catching up. I stepped a bit closer. He was backed up to his desk now. To a maximum of six, I said. Three on each hand, but only for the mortal sins. Once in a blue fucking moon. Do you understand me, Mr. Mulher? I laid off the sarcasm. I threw no extra weight into his name or the mister. He nodded. Good, I said. I'll be outside, always, counting. If I hear more than six, you're dead. A sharp dig to his gut. My fingers reminded me that they'd been broken before. He dropped the bag. Or you'll wish you were dead. I stepped back. If anyone else hears about this, I said, do I have to say more? He shook his head. I know, I said. It's a bit of a shock. I'm the caretaker, yeah? He nodded. He wasn't ready to talk. Your daddy told you all about the War of Independence, yeah? He nodded. And I bet he told you he was in the thick of it, I said. He nodded. Yes, he said, as he picked up his bag. And I bet you never really believed him. He has a medal. They all have fucking medals. <laughs> I didn't hit him. I was there, Mr Mulher, I told him, and I never got a medal. And I didn't have a fucking farm to go home to. 
I hadn't planned this. It was coming out from somewhere sore right behind the ribs. I moved in close again. I parked right up against him. The school bag was back on the floor. I shoved it aside with the wooden foot. No twinge or protest from the knee. If your dad was ever in the thick of it, it was because I ordered him to be in the thick of it. Where are you from, Mr Mulher? Kilkenny. I know every inch of it, I told him. Every ditch and hiding place. Is your dad still alive? Yes, that's because of me. Thanks. No problem. You understand me? Yes. Your dad and his brothers the co and cousins took their orders from me, and so do you. Yes, remember that, I told them. All those stories your dad told you, I'm in every one of them. I was there, and now I'm back. I stepped away. I was tired now. I'd gone too far. I was a gobshite. But the, other, the, teachers, the teacher didn't think so. He was shaking, trying to gather himself and stay whole. I opened the door. I'll be watching, I told him. I left him there, went, went up to the roof to do some shaking of my own. I watched Mulher walk across the yard to the gate and the, step, and the bus stop up on the main road. I shook till I stopped. I got down off the roof. I looked up and, sorry, I locked up and went home. I passed him the next morning. I made sure I did. Morning, Mr Mulher. Good morning, Henry. I fixed that latch for you, I said. Oh, thank you. No problem at all, I said. That's why I'm here. I watched him stand at the door of his room. He smiled at the boys who walked past him. He smiled big at every one of them. He looked at me and closed the door. I did the bits of business that would made the job and listened. Mulher didn't use the leather strap at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't overdo it. I left them alone and the others too. I knew they'd have, they had a few pints on Friday, the younger ones, after they'd emptied the school and cleaned their blackboards. I saw them gathering around the cars, giddy with, for drink, boys again, laughing much louder than they had to. They all pushed in. There were three cars and 17 of them. They didn't drink local. They wisely kept going on into town. I wished them well, and I knew Mulher would eventually yap. He'd move on to the small ones one, one Friday night and would all come out one of the, in one of the Kulshi pubs on the, shoulders, on the shoulder of a fat nurse from home. He'd tell them what had happened, or he'd tell her. He'd whisper it wet into her ear, and she'd pass it on when she'd... When she'd well, sorry, uh, I'll start again. And she'd pass it on when he'd gone to the jacks to vomit. She'd whisper into the ear of her off-duty pal who was sitting beside or on the knee of another of the teachers or his cousin, the guard. It would be all around the pub and out the back door by the time he'd finished puking and cleaned himself. The band in the corner would be putting it to music. I slowed down and let the job go at my new pace. I made more of my, li I made more of my limp. I did less work. No one complained. The place didn't collapse. The emergencies were rare and easily conquered. A leaking pipe blocked Jack's the odd broken window. I'm going to skip a bit there. He'd, so the, the, the news about what Henry had done passes on to the other staff members and uh, has its impact. And I'll just finish with this paragraph. For 15 years, the national, sorry, for 15 years, the boat boy. <laughs> <laughs> for 15 years, the boys' national school in Raheen was the most civilized place in the country. No child was slapped except on the days when I stayed at home. I'd made my own republic inside the railings of the school. It was a good life. How are you, Hoppy? I was tempted to ban subtraction. Addition and multiplication were grand, two and two, but there'd be no place for taking away in my republic. But I didn't do it. I couldn't ban reality, the hard knocks and grief that were waiting beyond the railings. Two and two was four, two from two was fuck all. It was the complete package. I didn't want to mould them. They'd be well able to do that for themselves. They eventually left for secondary school or the tech or the building sites, and the poor little fuckers didn't know what happened as the Christian brothers and other outside forces got their maulers on them. But the years in my school were enough. There was another way, and they went through their lives knowing that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Roddy. Um, did you ever get the Did you ever get the leather or the the, the bamboo yourself? I did, yeah, I did get it a lot. I got it a lot too. Did, but I, did you ever give it? No. Ah. Um, I started teaching in 1979, and it was in that first year where there was an announcement. The school was very new, young staff. T uh, hitting children wasn't pol policy. In fact, mm. it was uh, it was an, it was a big no. Uh, 
and it never, it, it, it wasn't even an issue, it wasn't even a conversation, but the announcement came over the intercom, the principal announced that uh, corporal punishment had been made illegal in the Republic of Ireland. So I never got my opportunity to batter the shite out of all was those that? years. But I did get, uh, yeah, yeah, I got, I, fun, it's a funny thing really, Colin, because I, I can think back with great affection at some of my primary school teachers, yet they were the same people who whacked me, you know? Mm. Different in secondary school because there was almost, I don't, know what, I don't want to be too extreme about it, and I suppose a teenager remembers differently, but uh, there was a certain enjoyment. I think certain teachers in the Christian Brothers School took huge enjoyment in, yeah. uh, in, in battering people, and I saw things in that school which would probably be called assault now and would get people put into jail. That's because you were on the north side of Dublin. Yes, that would contribute to where really lessons teachers did have... Uh, extra problems in parting lessons. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So I'm sure I'm sure they did it for our own good. It just didn't feel like that. I, I remember getting kicked out it. kicked out of class in third class by Mr. Kells and um, for, for messing around. And just as I was coming out uh, out of the room, um, the principal, Mr. O'Mara, comes into the room and I stepped aside because I'd been kicked out to go outside uh, and, and he says, Oh good boy, you call him he says because he thought I was being polite. Right? <laughs> and I hid in the coats Exactly 30 seconds later, a hand reaches out, mm -hmm. <laughs> grabbed me by the, by, by the hair, actually, mm. dragged me inside. Yeah, I remember, I remember I being my pants in front of the whole class. I remember being grabbed by the hair. Yeah. It's a happy memory. I wish I could be. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'd, I'd almost love it if a Christian would be grabbed me by the hair now. But, it's, uh, <laughs> but the, talking about change in, in, in Ireland and all that sort of stuff, and, um, you know, and, you know, well, corporal punishment, you know, the church and all this stuff. I mean, this novel and, 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 and so much of your work in general has been about going to the heart of the sort of mythology and um, de debunking the things. This is a glorious book, I have to tell Thank you, you that, uh, that's about, that's that's about yeah. memory and, 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 and imagination. The way we tell our stories and the way we challenge uh, the stories that, 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 that go on. So there's a lot going on here that's, take it, that's, that's taking sort of Ireland on, right? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's impossible when you live in Ireland, when, you know, as a, as a writer, when I like, as a citizen, I like the place, you know, I love living there, despite the, the gloom that's there at the moment, and it's pretty, I mean, the, 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 volcan the volcanic ash came as good news, it was so refreshing, <laughs> you know, because uh, no one was to blame, you know, it wasn't the economy, it wasn't climate change, you know, it was just a, a freak, you know. Uh, you know, as an atheist, I couldn't even blame God. <laughs> so uh, it was an act of something, but it was it was great because it knocked the economy off the headlines. But as a, as a citizen, as I was saying, I love I love the place. I really mm. like living there. But uh, as a writer, it's endlessly. I suppose everybody's place is endlessly fascinating in its sure. way. But it just changes and shifts, and just when you're settling into some notion of what Ireland is like, it kind of it doesn't let you down, but it kind of it kicks you. So uh, I find it constantly when I started the. Um, the three books that are now the Henry Smart story, if you like, the long, the the, the last roundup. Um, I started it in 1995, and I was having a quick look just to remind myself what the place was like or what things were happening in 1995. And 1995 was the first year, the first time that Jerry Adams was allowed into the United States. Mm -hmm. Clinton allowed him into the United States, and nobody knew really what was going to be, the, you know, the consequence of that action. And in, say, for example, in 95, Jerry Adams about the IRA also said, they haven't gone away, you know. Mm. And now, officially, they have, and basically, they do seem to have gone away. And when I was starting the book, I knew I was going to bring it up broadly to the present day, but I didn't know. Obviously, nobody knows what that present day is going to be, so I didn't really know how it was going to end. Particularly, I didn't know what its tone was going to be. You but know? The, it ends in 2010. Well, 2009, really, but yeah, let's not be fussy. Yeah, 2010, mm. yeah. But really, I, I, I didn't have a burning need to drag it right up to the present day. There's a, what, what now, looking back about 25 years, looks like a significant moment right. in the history of Irish Republican politics was my full stop, really. Right. I was very tempted then, I suppose, when, you know, because the, uh, the economy started taking that downward turn. Uh, and, you know, there was a certain panic in the air. I was very tempted to drag in another chapter, but I thought, no, 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 uh, that's a different book, or right. books. This could be the reality for the next 20 years. So, and I've been through, you know, my, my writing life started in one recession. Right. So it feels depressing in that familiar country somehow or other, but it's different yet again, you know. So uh, I just brought it to a stop there. 
And, and, and can you talk then a little bit about the American idea of, of, of Ireland and um, this, the, the, the first third of the book which deals with um, John Ford mm. and The Quiet Man yeah. and uh, Henry Smart getting involved with uh, writing the screenplay and then... And the Quiet Man. Yeah. yeah um, uh, well, again, it's, it's kind of, as I was writing the, A Star Called Henry, I knew that he was going to have to get out of the country. Mm. I knew quite early on that he, you know, he, was, he, was, he was never going to settle he was never going to settle for either one version or one compromise or anything. He was going to be that cranky individual that they had to get rid of, so to speak. So mm -hmm. I knew he'd had to, either I was going to kill him off at the end of the book or he was going to go somewhere else. And, you know, you basically you go up to the, the, to the port and you decide are you going to go east or west? And I decided he'd go the same way as, you know, for linguistic reasons as much as anything else, because I don't have any. Uh, the Irish education system taught me French, but I don't know it. Um, <laughs> But I, I decided to send him west, and I, you know, basically my, my head and my heart would have been going in that direction anyway. So he arrives in America in the 20s. So I have him going through the depression, the, you know, the, the, what became quite rightly known as the Roaring Twenties, and on into the depression. And I suppose I needed then my excuse to bring him back. Right. Because at the third book, at that point, he's going to come back to Ireland. And he's been with Louis Armstrong and you know, the whole thing. Yeah. And the reality is, a bit like you know, my, my sisters, for example, who lived in London a few years ago, they decided, you know, individually, they decided, well, we'll go back to Ireland now. You know, so it's mm. a simple, in many ways, it's a simple decision. But the, given the character and the context of the books, it needed something bigger than that. I just couldn't be Henry saying, OK, I'll go home now. Right. So I had seen, uh, I knew The Quiet Man off by heart. But because it's a film that I've watched all my life and I love it, but is um, that for your sins? Do you no, really I love it. it? I, I I don't know why. I don't feel the burning need to justify my my my, my loving of the film. I just love it. Really? But there were two things that happened quite quickly together on, that touch, hammered right. home the point. The front, I was in Wexford with my family, and it was one of those. Surprisingly enough, it was raining. Um, <laughs> Those of you who know Ireland will realise that that shut down the country. It was raining. We can't cope with it. But anyway, <laughs> there was nothing to do. So uh, there was an old uh, video of The Quiet Man. And my, my boys, I think, were four and two. And uh, they sat in front of this little telly, and we watched The Quiet Man. Mm. And it was extraordinary watching them watch it, because I was anticipating everything coming up, you know. But the brilliant thing was that every time Maureen O'Hara walked onto the screen, they started laughing. They thought she was hilarious, and I thought that was great, because I, I do too, mm. you know. And it's a fantastic combination, the most beautiful woman in the world, and also hilariously funny, you know. It's, uh, what can I say, I dot, 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 and I'll move on. But, um, so I thought that was great, I thought that was really fantastic that they, that they loved it. And then it was on a big screen in Dublin, and neither myself nor my wife had ever seen it on a big screen, so we went in to see it. And it was, you know, it's, it's a brilliant film, but Christ, on a big screen, it's just astonishing, you know, really astonishing. But I was looking at the credits at the end, and, uh, you know, I used to be, when I was 20, 21, look at all the credits and refuse to leave the cinema until mm -hmm. all the credits were over. I was a complete prick when it <laughs> came to that. You know, before I went off and got pissed, you know, I'd sit and I'd insist, you know, watch all the credits, best boy, gaffer, all that stuff. But anyway, down on the credits of the, of the Quiet Man were... IRA consultant, Ernie O'Malley. Ernie O'Malley. And I thought, with the modern notion of a consultant, you know, a consultant outside of medicine, a consultant is a chancer who gets paid a lot of money for right. stating the obvious, you know. <laughs> there was a story, a hospital in the Midlands of Ireland, a team of consultants arrived to, you know, to see how the place was run. And the first question they asked was, what, what are your opening hours in a hospital? <laughs> So anyway, IRA consultant. So at the back of my mind, I thought, well, that's great. Right. And then I read, uh, you know, because I was researching the IRA and the rest of it, I read Ernie O'Malley's books. Which, which is a great book. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was a good biography of him as well. And it, it mm. reiterated this notion that he met John Ford and he had come to Ireland and he had been in his role as I IRA consultant. He actually helped with the extras, mm. I think, because you know, the IRA's existence in the script. And of course, Ernie O'Malley has a tie-in with New York as well, right? His family lives yeah. here, I think, yeah. yeah they're all here. He died in 1957 mm -hmm. himself. But, uh, so it was just great. I, you know, I just thought, well, if Henry could be Ernie O'Malley, that gives me my excuse to bring... And I, I end up reading books about a film I love and right. having fun in, in this, because Henry, at least John Ford, gives Henry the idea that he's going to make a film of his life, you know, and so the story is about how, or the first third of the book, I suppose, is about how Ford and Henry colluding with him shape right. his story, which is quite a violent and a grim one, 
into the quiet man, which is neither violent nor well, it is violent, and you know we can't forget. It's but it gets longest, sanitized, and and his script yep. gets sanitized, and his story gets yeah. get, get, gets gets. And sanitized. there's a twist at the end, though. I don't want to give it away. Right. Because I really, if I say so myself, a very clever twist at the end. <laughs> I rarely, I don't, you know, when I'm working, even if I write a line that strikes me as funny, I never laugh, I never react in any way to it, really. I sometimes, when I'm finished, would feel a bit emotional, all right, because I've finished. But I never react in a way, but when I got that idea towards the end of the book, I did give a whoop, I've got to right. say. I did give a whoop. I, um, I got the sense, and I said this to you earlier on, that, 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 that you had a great... When I read this book, I had a great time with it. It felt that, 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 that you were having fun as well. Is that true? Sometimes. I don't know. You know, it's funny. People say, you know, even a film like The Commitments of the Snapper or something, people say, oh, it must have been great fun to do that, you know? But it's really, it's work, you it's know? Hard work. I, I love it. I love the work. I love doing what I'm doing. But sometimes that sense of fun is all about editing and re-editing and re-editing and taking out words and putting in words and taking more taking right. out and really that's it's work and I, I've, I was doing a bit this morning you know because I've finished a book for children or young young people as we're supposed to call them now and um, uh, I'm, you know again I finished it I finished the first draft last week and I was quite excited by that but mm -hmm. looking at it now doing it and it's very you know get very anxious because you're worried that you're throwing out stuff that shouldn't be thrown out or that there are gaps where there shouldn't be gaps. I like leaving gaps for the reader to fill in, including young people. But um, so it's work, you so know. But I, so I suppose the trick is to make it seem that you're enjoying it. Right. And in a way, I do yeah, enjoy sure. it. I wouldn't want to do it. But uh, it has to be sort of deceptive, have the, that, uh, the appearance of ease, deceptively easy. Yeah, well, that's, they, 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 I suppose. I always like to think that my book has a rhythm. My books have a rhythm, and the rhythm is work, you know, right. actually making sure that there isn't a syllable out of place. And that's, a per they, they are individual decisions, you know, they're not, they're not broad decisions, and they're not decisions I'd hand over to anybody else, so they're individual decisions. And they bring with them their anxiety, but I don't want to overstate it. I mean, I love what I do. Yeah. Uh, and we're lucky to do what we do. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, I think it, it's more, it's kind of like a pure form of self-employment, really, I right. find, you know, it's just... Uh, and now and again, I'd ask myself for a day off, and more times than not, I'll, I'll say yes. I'll look on it sympathetically. I'll look on the application sympathetically. You know, so it's, and it's it's great having no one to answer to, really. You know. You know, I'm going to be honest here. It's it, it's it's so. I um, I've been friends with with, with, with Roddy for, for for quite a while. It it's so heartening for me to come come upon people. There's a couple of other people say like like Michael and Dache who I've met who who live their life, and they live their life fairly well, and they seem to still have uh, a humility and decency, and they can sell their books and, 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 and get on and look after their family as well. So myself and Roddy get together, like we'll be talking about you know, football and, and, and kids and, 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 and children, things like that. Yeah. Um, Just when we got a few drinks in us, then we start bitching about the other Irish writers. <laughs> <laughs> All of whom are brilliant. Yeah, seven yeah. plus drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 you seem to ha have uh, b have that balance, and, and you've done a lot of you've done a lot of different things. You've done the kids' books. You've done mm. the um, you've also done the books for teenagers as well, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you've done the film scripts mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 well, w w which is most important to you? Novels. Novels. Novels for big people, mm. not young people. You know, mm. big people, adults. Yeah, you know, I, I, it'll never reach a point where I'll be told you have to do one or the other. But, uh, you know, if I had to choose one, it would be novels. Right. I've, I've recently, by recently I mean in the last five, six, seven years, started writing short stories. And that was great. That's like discovering a new form altogether. Sure. I never gave it much thought, funnily. I think a lot of people I, I come from stories to novels. I think you wrote stories I first, wrote, I you? started with stories, yeah. Yeah. I never did. I went straight into novels, you mm. know. I never really thought about short stories. I read but them and enjoyed them, but I never gave them much thought as to how you wrote them. Well, The Deportees was a, was, was a fantastic book and a necessary book. Thank you very much. Book. I don't really regard them as short stories in the strict sense. I mm. regard them as with little novels, okay. you know, oh. because they're written in little chapters. But uh, what's, the sto stories. what's the difference between a, a short story and a little novel? I think short stories are more precise somehow or other. I was in the company of a couple of short story writers in Galway there where you were last week and I, I really felt a bit uncomfortable after a while, although I really enjoyed the discussion because they were kind of suggesting that short stories are purer and a better form than the novel and I, you know, 
I was too polite to tell them they were talking through their arses, but mm. I felt that, <laughs> felt that way. But I think there's a precision to the short story, a little glimpse of a life, and it gave me opportunities to write things that wouldn't go into a novel, you know, little right. things. But uh, I just thought, when you were talking about, you know, the different forms, last summer, or just after the summer, when I finished that book and was all, you know, done and dusted except for proofreading and the odd little editorial tweak, I uh, wrote a script about the dogs that the Russians sent up in space in the 1950s. And it, it never occurred to me to do this, but I was asked to do it by friends of mine, the director, Michael Winterbottom, and his producer. But they're in this book as well, right, aren't they? Where, where were they? You, you, we mentioned them again somewhere recently, the dogs. Or at the least dogs. there's a couple of lines in here about the uh, about Oh, them. yeah, well, I, you know, yeah. dogs creep into the stories. They always, I don't know why. No, the dogs in outer space. Yeah. The so ones with the CCCP helmets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Laika being the most famous of them. Right. And it was great. I mean, it was fantastic. I was just... Uh, they had, been, they had been given a script about Yuri Gagarin, you know, the first man in space. And, mm. you know, they, uh, they couldn't get the finance for it because he, was, uh, he wasn't an American man. Um, right. So he didn't exist. <laughs> Yuri Gagarin, he's, he's not the fellow who bent the spoons, is he? No, that's, no, no, that's a different guy. <laughs> no, 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 Yuri Gagarin uh, wasn't <laughs> Michael Jackson's... Uh, in 1959, kind of actually, wasn't he? He went up... Yuri no, 60-something. 60 60-something, 60 yeah, 60 60, I think, oh. yeah. Like I went up in 1957, I think. Okay. But I, t I started doing the research, you know, and it was fantastic. And I'm sitting there, and this really was one of those moments, and it may not, it, it, they're very happy with the script, but it may never, let's see this, you know, it may never mm. be, so, it'll cost a fortune to make, you know, so it may never happen, but it was just the job was just so great. I mean, I started reading about the space race and reading Tom Wolfe's... Oh. Uh, you know, the right stuff, and reading uh, about uh, life under Stalin, you know, and reading Solzhenitsyn, because the, a lot of the scientists involved in this had spent time in the gulags, and, you know, the only reason they survived was because Stalin had everyone else killed, so they ran out mm -hmm. of experts, so they got out, you know. And uh, then the dogs themselves, they were all female, they were all street dogs, they were all tiny because you couldn't put up much weight. The first went up in the early 50s, you know. They were all off the streets of Moscow, so it immediately became a story about these Moscow women, you know, Great. as opposed to, because the dogs talk naturally enough, you know, so it was absolutely, and again, I don't know if anybody will, will ever see the film, if it'll ever be made, but I just thought to myself when I was doing it and writing the script and getting the dogs to start to talk to each other and starting to think in terms of, you know, the, what this place looked like and, you know, uh, it was just how to tell the story in a two-hour script. Right. It was just absolutely fantastic. And doing this while listening to the Red Army Chorus, you know? There you go. Brilliant. Really but isn't, brilliant. isn't this our privilege that, that, that we get to explore? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And... Uh, I don't know about you. I, I feel like every time I, I hop into a novel, I feel like I go back to university for two, three, four years. Starting is lovely. Yeah. I, I'm about to start another novel. I'm really kind of trying to wait until I get home because it's not a, you know, starting on a plane or waiting for a plane right. as I will be for the next couple of weeks isn't uh, ideal, it's a bit stupid but I'm kind of chomping to start, you know, yeah. really, really am I love starting it's about, about somewhere in the second year you begin to wonder why yeah, it's, like but <laughs> it's a bit like a relationship really you know. Yeah. Uh, it is, and, and, and the thing of it is um, because you dream it the, 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 way you, the, the way you have it and you dream it and, and, and then you go home and then you try to get that dream out through your fingers onto, onto, the, onto the keyboard, yeah. and it's just never the same thing as what you dreamt. It'll yeah. never be as good as what you, you so dreamt. So you have to, to you know, basically, it's a bit like, um, so you have to kind of forget about the original dream and just work with what you have, and that's what I love editing, you know, right. because you've got a bit of a mess on the page, and then you get, I suppose the ex-teacher, I get the red ballpoint, and I start going through it then. I, I print out what I've done, and I go through it, and really, like even this morning, I took away a little paragraph, and then mm. that paragraph seemed vital when I wrote it a couple of months back. But I lifted it out, and just by joining what now were, you know, the, the first and the third, and get rid of the second, suddenly it lit up. You know, right. it was great. But it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't put down the, that paragraph in the first place. You right, know? right, right. So I kind of, I know what you, exactly what you mean that you have this notion of what it's going to be like, and it's mm. not. But I find then the exciting compensation is you invent something else entirely instead. Right. So with the short stories, they're kind of, in a way, they're, they're, they're more autobiographical than anything I've ever done. But very, very early on, that element of it, the autobiography, is completely irrelevant. Hmm. It's nothing to do with it anymore, you know. You've been publishing some of them in The, in the New Yorker. Yeah, I've been lucky. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's about six in The New Yorker. And then there's about, there's a collection now. I've done, a, I've done enough for a collection, but some of them haven't appeared yet. There's one going into Joe O'Connor's collection of stories. Oh, and there's right. another yeah. going into The Sunday Times, and another going into The Guardian. So they're all... 
they're all done, but they're all going into various places. How do you manage the whole business of it? Uh, like of of the whole, the whole writing life with the, all the stuff going on. So yeah, you know, you have to send that story uh, off to Joe. Yes, you have to send that story off to the Sunday Times. Yeah. You have to deal with your editors over here. You got French editors. You got German editors. You got yeah. stuff going on at home. You yeah. got, you're thinking about screenplays. I mean, that is an enormous sort of balancing act that well, you have you to do. You do it too. So yeah. uh, again, sometimes it seems to get in the way. Mm. Sometimes the timing isn't exactly right. You know. Uh, but I'm very disciplined, you know. When I'm working, I'm working, and you know, uh, I do a lot of other work outside of the office. I work in an attic at home, uh, and uh, but I do a lot of other work. But I kind of compensate for it. I have no difficulty sitting down at nine o'clock in the morning and just working, you know. <laughs> and uh, I've, no, I've no difficulty knowing when um, I'm not working that uh, the work isn't re really good. Mm. But I'll just work my way through it, and I'll come back then and fix it later. I'd rather just be pragmatic about it rather than. Precious. Does Belinda read it? Does she? Belinda, my wife, would be the first person to read it, but only yeah. when I feel it's finished. And is it is it is it tough? Because I know when my wife Alison, when she reads my stuff and she she doesn't like it, I go around in a in a huff for yeah. about like three days. You know, yeah. you don't love me anymore, sort of stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's no no point in us doing wife swap because obviously <laughs> we live in the exact same type. Of <laughs> <laughs> Banging the head you off know, the wall. Wouldn't be a good program. <laughs> Column goes to the Doyle house. He finds it exactly the same. <laughs> uh, I, I used to be awful. Yeah. You know, I think with, um, I can't remember which book it was. I think it might have been Paddy Clark. Ha, ha, ha. She was sitting up in the bed reading it, and I was kind of pretending to read and leaning across. And, what are you laughing at? You know, and then I thought, why didn't you laugh at that? You know? <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, no, I'm better now. I'm much better. What about the critics? Uh, I hate them. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I've been advised by another writer not to read them, and it's very good advice, right. but I couldn't take it. I'd limps at them. Yeah. And uh, I've had more than my share of bad ones, you know, really, really bad you, ones. But, but you had a hard time early on. Uh, listen, I remember uh, the first right. time I saw Roddy, I didn't even talk to him, but probably talked about 10 years later, but he, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure that you were outside the SFX Centre, which was a, a, a rock venue um, in Dublin, selling the commitments. More than likely, yeah. Because yeah. I bought my first version. Yeah. I still have that at home, actually. Yeah. My first. That would be, that would be worth, it, years worth a lot ago. of money it now. It is, apparently. If it's in good yeah. condition, it's worth a lot of money, yeah. But it, was, uh, it was an amazing thing for me to read, because yeah. I was like, oh, I didn't really entirely understand that you could write this way in the vernacular. Obviously, the Irish novel had been brought to the city like by Joyce, but not many people had been in the city for quite a while, mm -hmm. right? And then you came along, and then it was like, you know, fucking this, fuck that, uh, and, 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 and yet it worked as a, 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 as, a, as a literary thing. I could see that come off the page, and it's like, but I've never seen that done on the page, uh, until then. No, well, um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I just felt it very strong, uh, you know, I felt when I started, I'd been writing away for years and nothing good, really bad, actually most of it terrible, and then when I started writing the commitments, I think because I had a big gang of people on the page at the one time, uh, descriptions and things like that just got in the way, yeah, you know, off. and sort of he said, she said, and trying mm. to maybe try to add, add verbs to go with the said so that you could capture the tone, it just seemed completely irrelevant. Mm. So I think really the commitments invented me as much as me the other, you know, because I right. think during the writing of the book, I came up with what I really wanted to do. Did you know what you were doing? At the time, quite early on, yeah. You di did you know it was important? No, I mm. still don't. I don't, uh, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't burden anybody with the, I, uh, you know, uh, it's not for me to say that, and I don't actually, right. I feel it obviously personally important. It's important to me personally, but I don't expect it to be seen that way by anybody else. And I'm not being coy or modest, I actually, honestly. No, I, 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 I believe you, but, yeah. but, but in so many ways we get our voice from, from others. It's the way what we read, what we get from, and I, I'm, I'm interested in knowing where, where, where do you think your, your, your voice came from? What were the writers that, that gave you well, an, there were an ability writers, to do I mean, the there, was, there was Raymond Carver, for example, uh, there was Flann O'Brien when I was a kid, I was a, a teenager, and beyond that, the dialogue, for example, in, particularly in um, At Swim Two Birds, mm. I never read anything as funny as the dialogue, the Dublin dialogue in At Swim Two Birds, and I'd never seen it before. Mm. I read him before I read Joyce, you know? Right. So it was, it was really that, just how he could twist what was very mundane conversations, you know, really boring, dull conversations between middle-aged dullards, really, in many, many ways. And it was the funniest stuff. And it was a group activity as well, because it was me and a gang of friends who are still really 
hang around with quite a lot. And we were 16 or 17 reading this stuff and then quoting it. You know, I know we weren't alone because half of the people of our age were doing the exact same thing, but it, was, uh, right. it just seemed, it seemed wonderful. It seemed quite liberating, you know, to be in a country that was actually a bit of a dump back then, you know, yeah, it wasn't sure. getting anywhere, to find this glorious stuff, you know. I think maybe um, Sean O'Casey could have been a bit of an influence. I read him a lot and I really liked his, uh, his plays and it began to dawn on me when I was looking at his plays that they weren't realistic, the dialogue wasn't in any way realistic at all. Mm. It was kind of very heightened right. and the better for it. So I, uh, you know, I began to, when I started writing my own dialogue, I then started, you know, inflating it a bit, not trying to capture reality, but taking, making rules for myself that would make it appear as if it was dialogue exactly as spoken on the streets. But, you well, know, you know, maybe it just happens that it's spoken on the page and that's enough. Because yeah. if it pops up off the page and it feels right, yeah. uh, then... But, but you're obviously making all sorts of rhythmic musical decisions with, 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 with the dialogue. Because when, when I read it, it, it makes yeah. the music in my head. But also you're doing very important things like you're dropping the he said, she said in at the most strategic point yeah. to guide the reader back in yeah, again. Yeah. And I love that sort of stuff. Well, I do too. You know, I love that. And that's kind of... Uh, there's two things, it, it's kind of, these are it, like almost practical decisions, I mean, is it, you know, just reminding people of who said what, you know, just mm. bare minimum, but it's also, you know, you put in a he said, and that might have consequences, because it could be about like adding, a, adding an extra word to the line of a song, and the song trips a bit, and it, right. you know, it can't be there. I remember listening to Elvis Costello being interviewed about uh, working with Burt Bacharach, you know, that very good album that they made about ten, maybe probably more t than ten years ago. But he was talking about how Bacharach would not, and Elvis Costello's lyrics, as you know, you, you know, why have 20 words in a line when you can have 23? And he keep, you know, he's, that's the glory of his early work. And, right. But uh, Bacharach wouldn't let him have another syllable. It had to be exactly perfect, perfect. And uh, it was fascinating listening to him talk about that. And I feel the same way, really, that um, uh, it's not that I don't like words, I do. But I think sometimes uh, the lack of words can say a lot as well. You know? right. Um, so, and then well, that's it. Get, get you know, get minimal. Get, you know, everything that Carver said, uh, you know, is said in um, you know in in what he doesn't say as well. You know? Yeah, I think if you if you you know if you're in a row with somebody or you're witnessing a row between people, I think if you're trying to recapture it later on, it's actually what isn't said is often the right. more interesting well, somehow. Sure. Or the drama is in what isn't said. Talking about what isn't said, I want to g give you guys the chance to start thinking up and dreaming up your questions and um, <laughs> coming down towards. I can't quite see out, so the microphones are down um, by the side, isn't that correct? Um, so anybody who, who, who's, uh, who wants to ask a question, if you can come on down. If you can um, the lights up, maybe it would be easier. You know, um, Don DeLillo talks about, um, you know, uh, I, we have a literature that's sometimes too ready to be neutralized, that's sort of too ready to become part of the ambient noise, that the writer has to sort of stand outside of society for a little while and then get in and, 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 and uh, do. do. Do you believe in, say, the power of the writer? Do you, do, do you think about any of these things when, you, when, you, when you've written a book? Do you, you know, how important your voice is, say, to Irish culture? Or, I don't think you know? about it. I really don't think about it. I suppose I have been, I've been very, very lucky to have been involved or responsible for uh, a few moments that would have been, you know, stamps on Irish culture, like sure. Commitments, for example, the movie, well, well, Family, the family, television series, yeah. which, had a, which had a huge impact in Ireland, and a few other things as well. And, uh, but that was only afterwards. Yeah. I didn't actually think about these things on the, you know, I self-published the Commitments. I know uh, that. Because at first, you know. Well, um, it was a time when, 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 when it, was, it was very tough for, for, for Irish writers to get published. I mean, Neil Jordan had sort of paved the way in certain ways yeah, yeah. Um, with, uh, you know, the, the, the Irish Writers, writers Cooperative and things yeah, like yeah. that. But it was still yeah. hard to get an Irish book published. It was, and uh, probably still is in some ways, I think. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I, no, I don't really think about consequences until it's too late, really. Okay. And well, that's good. I mean, well, then maybe that's, that's how you keep your, your, your sense of humility and, and, no, and these, or engagement. And, you know, basically, it's between me and the page. And it's mm -hmm. not a, you know, it, it's again, a, you know, if you start saying, I'm writing a book, if I start thinking maybe 18 months ahead and wondering what passage will I read when I'm here, you know, or yeah. in Portland, Oregon on Tuesday night, if I start thinking these things, 
the book will fall apart because right. I, I won't be thinking about the book. The book is the, it's, it's the words on the page, not right. me reading them. That's, that's incidental. That's kind of irrelevant. It's right. not necessary. So uh, it's always between me and the, it's always between me and the book. Okay. And you know, I'm sure you're similar. If you're talking, I find so if I'm talking about something that I haven't finished yet, I really feel it falling apart. And you lose it. You yeah, lose the magic yeah. of it. Yeah. So I'm very reluctant to talk about work I haven't finished yet. Right. It's like a, it's like a little whisper that you have. It's like a little secret that you have. Yeah. And if you make it public and you and you let them know exactly what's going on, yeah. then you've sort of lost it. We have a question over here. Yes. Um, in solidarity, I also love the Quiet Man and. Great. I wondered if you could say... You can make a little society of yourselves. Yeah. Well, no, we're not alone. We're not alone. <laughs> we're not alone. Yeah. There's many. And I just wondered if you could just say, you know, briefly why you think, from a storytelling point of view, and of course in relation to the Dead Republic, it's a story that has endured nearly 60 years after it was released and nearly 80 years after it came out as a short story. Yeah. Well, I Thank think you. one of the reasons why is that it's a, you know, if you're sitting in Ireland and you watch it, probably there's something in you telling you, you shouldn't like this. Because there are similar attempts at doing that whimsical picture of Ireland, which are absolutely awful. There was one, I think, in the cinemas in Ireland a couple of, month, a couple of weeks ago, where, you know, people in a rush to get to Dublin get caught behind cattle, you know, because the cattle are on the road. And there's no such thing as a motorway or a highway. And, I believe that, you know, even at certain places there's no electricity in the houses. I didn't go to see the movie myself. <laughs> What's the movie? I can't remember the name of it, but it, it, it sounded like a complete pup. All together. If it anyway, had been sheep, it would have been all right. Yeah. But there have been attempts. Yeah, yeah, or um, ostriches. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Said, I drove by an ostrich farm recently. <laughs> anyway, I think because despite the fact that, strictly speaking, probably it shouldn't work, it actually does. You know, and it's it's it's. I think it's down to you know because I've I've heard people get I've heard people on the radio in Ireland they really explode when people start talking about the Quiet Man, because it's not as it should be you know, and yet within the within the two hours of its existence I think it's it's perfect, it's perfect. It's not a good idea to go to Ireland you know by all means go to Kong where it was made. And thousands of people do. I was there myself last August, again. Um, my first trip to Kong, I was, I was shown all the locations by a Japanese man <laughs> who was able to tell oh, me the name can, of the scene. Can I tell them the story about... Um, no, you tell them the story. He's going to take my story. No, you do, because I don't know what you're talking about. The, 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 story, <laughs> the story about um, uh, the snapper, and um, I'm scarlet for you. You don't, don't know this? That one. Okay. Well, apparently... Uh, the um, the translation there's a, there's a Dublin phrase when you're embarrassed for someone and you say I'm scarlet for you mm -hmm. right which is used a lot in the snapper especially when um, she gets pregnant and yeah. she, you know, and uh, the Japanese translation of I'm scarlet for you was which what any Dubliner who's here will, will will smile when you say I'm scarlet for you but the Japanese translation was I'm socially embarrassed for your predicament. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. It was a subtitle down the side of the screen. Yeah. But uh, back to the quiet man, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's, I suppose in many ways for Irish America, it was Ireland as they felt it was or what they'd lost and what it should be, you know. Mm. And in many ways then in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s, it was, there, was a, there were real attempts to make that place, to sell Ireland as that place. And now that uh, it, uh, tourism and culture, the word culture has become a buzzword in Ireland again, right. are the only growth industries for the time being. I'm sure the pressure will be on to somehow uh, see if we can, you know, manufacture the quiet man world again. Do you think? But not, to, not. To, I mean, when we're talking about culture and, and stuff, I mean, uh, now Gabriel Byrne is the Irish ambassador, cultural ambassador. Now they're doing they're doing things here in New York, setting up a, an Irish art centre. Mm -hmm. Like people are quite progressive about it. They they, they don't want to go back to the sort of. A-U-L-D sort yeah. of idea well, of Ireland. It worries me a bit. I mean, I, you know, I'm not being critical of Gabriel at all. I think he's brilliant. He I've is met brilliant. Him several yeah. times, and I, I, you couldn't but like him, I think. But right. it, I'm not worried. It's not that. It's just the, when politicians start, you, when politicians who have basically uh, been more than a little bit responsible for the, the, the destruction of the Irish economy in the first place, right. when around about St. Patrick's Day, they suddenly all start talking about culture. 
the time has come to start you, worrying about it. Because they can't talk about mortgages or anything or, or anything else? My worry about it is that our Irish culture and we are right. you know, we are part of that, is not there to entice people into the country to give a, a pleasant picture of the country so that people will come and look at it. Right. So that if I want to write about domestic violence, for example, or if I want to write about unemployment, if I want to write about ugly things, uh, well, there's nobody going to stop me and I can't see it working. But yeah, but nobody's going, to, nobody's going to ask you to, 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 to do that. I mean, uh, you know, people will still go back and having read The Woman Who Walked Into Doors, and they, they, they'll they still go back and, mm. and, and experience um, an, an Ireland. I mean, I disagree with you on this, that, that, that you know, culture is being sort of um, misaligned and, and appropriated. I mean, if it's what we've done very well uh, for, 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 for a long time, let it be what we've done yeah, very well. But we won't tell the artists well, what to write. It remains to be seen, but I think also uh, a lot of the artists have been jumping up and down and a wee bit too giddy about it as well. And I've heard artists as if somehow or other they're not part of society or they're not somehow involved in what has happened in Ireland. I mean, we, we, um, we're a democracy, so we elect the government that we have. Right. And we have people on the radio saying, well, our artists never let Ireland down. Artists aren't bankers, our artists aren't Well, who's politicians. saying that, though? Well, I won't name names because it wouldn't be fair, but name people who I really thought should know a bit better. Yeah. And they're gloating a bit, as if somehow or other they're pure. Yeah, yeah. And they're talking about, you know, so I, I just... I don't I think suppose it, artists column, will get co-opted, kind of, though. I work in an attic, and that's the ideal place to yeah, work. Yeah, but me too, you know. You know, it's the ideal place to work, and I come out when I'm finished. Right. And I think that's the way it should remain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't think... I think if I can come, say, if I come to the United States talking on my own behalf about a book that I've written, rather than come here as some sort of a roving representative of my nation, mm. and uh, that, that, I suppose that's what makes me uncomfortable, really. Well, I suppose the, the, the tagline for what they're talking about is like, what is my nation? You know, that old Joycean question. Um, it actually goes back to Shakespeare and Mac Morris, but, um, you know, they're talking about the, the nation being the imagination, and the imagination can go anywhere. I mean, because Irish novels can take place in, in uh, South well, America. Irish novels can take place in, 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 in Japan. Yeah, you know? well, they've taken place in many places outside the beyond Ireland right. in your books as well, you know? So yeah. I think, again, who, who owns or who controls culture is, down, is what it's down to. And I think the books, the three books, these Henry Smart books, if, it, if they're about anything at all, they're about identity. Right. And who is it that gives us our identity? And there was, I suppose, there were attempts going back to the quiet man John Ford gave America an identity, but he also gave Ireland an identity in The Quiet Man, Absolutely. with The Quiet Man. And the, the, the provost tried to bomb an identity into us. The IRA tried to bomb it. Can we talk about this? I mean, if there, are there any questions here? You're, please, please, because we're recording this, that's why we have to ask you to go to the microphone. Please feel free to, to, to ask questions, because this, this is your time. Hi, thank you. Um, Roddy Doyle, I'm just so always stunned by the velocity of your narrators, your characters on the page, the short stories and the novels. Two-part question. One is just a rhetorical. How's Paula Spencer doing? I <laughs> hope to see her again. I'd love to see her again. I wonder, when you're in the middle of a short story or novel or trilogy, and you slip into the skin of these characters, <coughs> is, it, is it difficult for you, over the course of a novel, to reclaim, to, to stay in that skin? Or is that a relatively easy part for you? Um, the first thing, Paula, I mean, uh, I've written two books close to Paula, one narrated by her and then one very close to her, the, the one that was published what, five years ago, six years ago. And, uh, you know, outside of that, she doesn't exist. She's, um, she's a fictional character. You're kidding. But she is a character. <laughs> she is a character that I'd be interested in going back to. But it's not a plan as yet. I yeah, think it'll be daughters, too soon after the last one. But yeah. there are other characters that, I've, uh, that I kind of came up with years ago, and I'm interested in going back to them because I think I'd be interested in seeing what life is like for them now. But I don't give them much thought outside of the books once I'm finished with them. The, the other question you had, I think when I start a book, I've only a vague, if it's a new character, or even if, in the case of this one, it's an old character, but he's old, so he's a different man in many ways. It takes a while to get to know them, really, to get to know their language. So a lot of what I'd write early on, sometimes the first few sentences will stay. But after that, it becomes very vague. And it can be vague. In the case of the woman who walked into doors, the writing was vague for a good six to nine months, maybe even a year. 
And then gradually I began to feel that I knew her and I knew the words that she was choose. But it's, it's kind of bloody mindedness. You keep going at it, you know, three pages, four pages, five pages a day. Leave it alone for a while. Don't be too fussy about it. Go back later and hack it away. But leave it for a while and you get to know them. Now and again, moving away from, a, you know, I try always, same as I am now, away for two weeks, away from my desk, or more importantly, away from home for two weeks. I try to make sure that I'm not, uh, I'm not in the middle of a paragraph, so to speak, when I leave, that I've, I've come to the end of something logical so that I wouldn't be worried about losing the thread. But I do. And uh, there's, a, there's a middle section of a book that's always hard work. And, uh, but I, I, I kind of trust myself as an editor to... If, if, if the work is vague and, say, between pages 100 and 200, if I hack away at it, it'll be pages 100 to 47 or 52 or something, and that vagueness is on the floor. If I'm not mistaken, Paula would be about 53 now. She was 48 or something. She's about a year or two older in, than me, so she'd be 53 or 4, yeah. Yeah, and she's an amazing character. Thank you. Um, when, I, when I read The Woman Who Walked Into Doors, it was just like one of those things where you say, you know, you won't forget the experience of having having been in in, in this world, and and you know, and 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 that's what it means to, to 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 write a great book and to contribute to I think one's surroundings and and, and culture, having known people, and actually my my first investigation was like actually when a, a young journalist was into um, battered women and mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I saw this book and just thought wow that 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 you could do that and inhabit that character was. Um, was a splendid thing. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, the, the book and the books have had an incredible career, really. There's been an opera by a Belgian company. There were two stage adaptations. There's another one on the way in Germany. Uh, there was one in France, I know, right? Um, yeah, the one woman show, yeah. Alain Fouare. Yeah. yeah. So great. it was great to go to Paris and to see it in French, you know. Quite extraordinary, really. Talk about like uh, the, the 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 right in life. You know, it's great to go to Paris. How about that? Uh, well, you know, it's it's funny, isn't it? You write a book, you know, you know that's set and grounded in reality, yeah. and and then um, you're heading off around the world. Yeah, yeah, it's mad, really. I I don't do too much of it, really. I I, I it's it's actually about six years since I did interviews in, in, yeah. with any regularity. So. It's still a little bit of a novelty with this, this book. It came out a month ago in, the, in Ireland and the UK, so I've been doing interviews and a bit of travel. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, it's good and sometimes it's a pain in the neck. I think in, on, there are days when you begin to hear yourself saying the exact same thing yeah, yeah. again, and that, that, that's not healthy, you know, which is why I gave up doing it for quite a while, right. because it just, I, didn't, uh, I didn't like what I was hearing. It wasn't that I was, wasn't being honest, I was. I just felt, I don't know, especially because ill, to be, to be honest with you, after it. But it is, yeah, it's, I, I try to be as positive as I can about it. You know, I'm in New York, so that is not hardship. Right, exactly. And I'm in a nice hotel, and I was able to lie in bed for a while this That's morning. Great. Which is kind of... And Chelsea won. And Chelsea won. I actually watched, this is great, I watched uh, my team beat Liverpool in a pub at half eight this morning. Right. <laughs> I was drinking water, but right. nevertheless, there was something slightly wrong or illegal. <laughs> Even though they let me into the place to be in a pub at half eight on a Sunday morning watching English football. Right. There you know, you the Christian brothers would be appalled. <laughs> you know? I, I think that's a perfect place for us to, 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 to wrap it up. Thanks to all the audience. Thanks for the questions. Thank you very much. Um, Thank and, you, Colin. Uh, no, it's, it's my, it's, it really is a pleasure. It's always a pleasure uh, to talk to you privately then and publicly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Roddy Doyle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.